Hey guys, what we're going to be talking about in this video are the three phylums that you should have read about this week, annelids, mollusks, and echinoderms. So let's just go right on in and get started. So first up is phylum annelida, also known as the segmented worms. That's what we're talking about here. They're worms that are divided into segments. In other words, their, pot, their bodies have divisions to them. Now, the most obvious one that we often think about are things like earthworms. And yes, this is a real earthworm right here. Uh, it's a giant subspecies, or not subspecies, but it's a giant species of earthworm that can be found in Australia. And I think there may be some in South America, but I'm not sure about that one. Uh, but earthworms aren't the only things that are considered segmented worms. In fact, most of these segmented worms actually live in the ocean and in uh, fresh bodies of water. They are the tube worms. Uh, so these tube worms here, like this one, the Christmas tree worm, these are actually just the filter feeding portions of the worm that you see sticking up out of like their little uh, home. But nonetheless, tube worms that like live in the ocean, they're a segmented worm. And also the freshwater cousins here, leeches. And so if you guys have ever heard of leeches before, or if you haven't ever heard of leeches before, those are basically the little segmented worms that people uh, will sometimes get on their skin. They're, they can be parasitic because they uh, do just that. They leech off of you and they suck your blood, basically. And uh, they, they use those blood meals then to help with incubating their eggs and everything. But uh, nonetheless, leeches are a segmented worm. Another little fun fact about leeches is when they swim, it's in a perfect wave. Now, uh, this is like talking about like trigonometry and calculus and whatnot, but their their movement is what we'd consider a perfect sine wave. Uh, that's S-I-N wave. So like sine, cosine, tangent. And when they swim, it makes a perfect sine wave. And so that's just a random little fact about these guys, but all other annelids don't necessarily swim that way, but all other annelids do have the basic body structures or very similar ones to what we're going to be talking about here. And so these are mainly, these characteristics here mainly refer to just our earthworms, but nonetheless, some of these could apply to other annelids. So first of all, they have bilateral symmetry, just like the flatworms and the roundworms we looked at. That bilateral symmetry means that it can be cut right down the middle and divide it into two segments. That's why when we've done our worm dissections in the past, when we would cut down, we have one straight line that goes right down the middle of our worm. And that's so we can see the right and left portion, or what we consider the right and left portion of the worm. And another thing that's important about this is our worm has two openings. He has uh, a mouth and an anus. And again, it seems kind of weird to say something like that is such a significant feature, but it really is a significant feature for animals because of what it allows them to do. So you can see here again, it has the mouth and just going through the digestive parts and everything real quick. The mouth leads into the pharynx and then the pharynx leads into the esophagus. And uh, right here, it's not listed, but this would be considered the crop. And the crop, it's kind of like, you can think of it like your stomach. Now, when we think of a stomach, we think of it starting to digest things. And yes, our stomach does do that. But more so, our stomach is used for storage. And that's what the crop on a worm is for. It's for storage. Again, it's hard to see because of these blood vessels in the way, but that's where your crop is at. And so that crop is kind of where when the worm eats whatever's in front of him, because that's how they eat. They just eat whatever's in front of them, the dirt and all. So whatever that is, it goes into the crop, and as it's in this crop, it's just going to be stored there until it can move to the gizzard. And here it says the digestive tract, and so we have uh, the gizzard is what we call a mechanical stomach. Now again, our stomach works for storage like a crop, but it also does mechanical digestion. And what that means is, if you've ever heard your stomach gurgle, it's doing mechanical digestion at that time. In other words, it's contracting, it's twitching, 
it's moving all around, kind of squeezing the contents that are inside, trying to make them into mush. And that's what a gizzard does too. If you've ever heard of a gizzard, like from a bird, like if you've eaten gizzards before, that's the same thing, but for birds. And birds generally sometimes will even have stones inside their gizzard to help with that mechanical process of breaking down the food. So again, it enters the mouth, goes through the pharynx, down the esophagus, into the crop where it's stored until it can be digested or broken down by the gizzard. Once broken down by the gizzard, the entire rest of the digestive system goes through the entire worm's body, where as the food and whatever other materials are being processed through here, the worm is absorbing as many nutrients as it can until it all comes out the other end as worm castings. And these worm castings are actually really good for gardening and things like that. That's why when you go to Lowe's or some other home store like that, sometimes you might see bags of worm castings in the garden department because it's good for the plants. And yes, when it says worm castings, it's just a giant bag of worm poop. So, other things again, it's epidermis, it's outer skin, very much like an amphibian. It's kind of breathable, it's kind of permeable. And so this allows for it to breathe in and out and get the oxygen that it needs without needing lungs. We need lungs to do that. But worms, they just have a skin that allows them to. How they move, if you've ever, ever watched a worm move, you can kind of see them doing those contractions where these segments will pull on one another. And they do that with the two muscle layers that they have. Now, if you've ever tried to pull a worm up out of the ground, sometimes that might be rather difficult. It's funny as it is because they don't have arms or legs. And the reason for that is because of the setae that they have. And these setae are these tiny little hairs. Uh, you can kind of see them right here on this worm diagram. Those are the setae. They're not very long, but they have them nonetheless on pretty much every segment of the worm's body. And so like if a bird or something is trying to pull the worm up out of the ground, it will take those setae and it will contract and try and help them to stick into the ground. Some worms, like the tube worm here, has used those setae in a different way. And they've been designed to use that setae as a filter feeder. And then, last but not least, they do have sensory receptors like our uh, planarians we talked about. Again, we've done studies where they'll do electroshock, where they'll stick like rods in the ground, and they'll put electricity in them, and then all the worms come to the surface. Now, again, this might seem kind of painful, but it lets these people who study worms be able to look and see what different types of worms are actually there in the ground in the first place. And so that's why they use them. And then, of course, they have a closed circulatory system. All right. If you don't write anything else down for worms, write that they have a closed circulatory system down. And that's very important because what this means is that they do have blood that's circulating throughout the entire body, but it's going to remain basically in these arteries and veins and in the blood vessels and in these little aortic arches that are kind of like hearts. In other words, it's not going to be mixing with everything else in here. It's not going to be kind of like uh, an insect. An insect might not have a closed circulatory system. It has something known as a hemolymph, which is kind of like this fluid that goes throughout the body. Worms aren't like that. Worms are actually more like us in this sense, where they have a closed circulatory system. And what that means is that the blood doesn't go anywhere else except in the arteries and the veins. And uh, some of the very small arteries for uh, transfer of oxygen and other things like that. But nonetheless, that blood is not going to get mixed in with the rest of the body. That's why it's called a closed system. All right, so now we're going to be moving on to one of the largest phylum or phyla in the world which are the mollusks. Now, arthropods, which we're going to be talking about next week, are the largest overall. But mollusks take the second place here because they are just so diverse. And uh, surprisingly, quite a few characters in SpongeBob are invertebrates. And so you can see we have some of our friends here to help us out. So uh, as you can also see, SpongeBob, or not SpongeBob, Gary, Squidward, 
and uh, Patrick, they don't look the same. And looking at this now, I don't know why Patrick's here dancing, because he is not a mollusk, right? Starfish are not mollusks, just letting you guys know that. But nonetheless, they are all invertebrates. And so, uh, but let's look at Gary and Squidward here for a second. Squidward is a squid. Gary's a snail. They look nothing alike. Uh, Squidward has, you know, eight tentacles. And uh, Gary does not. Gary has those uh, enlarged eyes that come out in the one shell. Squidward does not. And so, as you can see, the phylum mollusca is very broad. And other ones that aren't even included on here are clams and bivalves and univalves. They're all mollusks. And so let's see how uh, the, the phylum mollusca is divided into three large groups. And so we're going to look at each one of these groups individually. First off is gastropoda. All right. And uh, gastropoda just simply refers to the fact that they really don't have feet. And this includes your snails and your slugs. Some of them are going to have a shell, making them what's known as a univalve organism. Uh, others just don't have any shell. They live in freshwater environments, they live in marine environments, and they also live in terrestrial environments. Uh, we have lots of snails that live in freshwater here. We also have land snails. They can be pests in your gardens from time to time. Uh, and they can also be a host. For other parasites. If you watch that video about the flatworm that parasitizes snails, you can see that. And so again, these guys, uh, what really puts them in this category is just their shell and the way that they move. Because again, not all of them are going to have a shell. I'm talking about you slugs. So it's the way that they move generally, the way that their body plan is, that's what aligns them up with gastropods. Uh, I don't have a picture on here, I wish I did, but talking about sea slugs, there's actually the name sea slug kind of sounds like a oxymoron because you wouldn't think of a sea slug as being pretty, but some of them are actually some of the most beautiful invertebrates that you could ever see if you just look them up. And so they would be the what we consider that live in the marine environments. But another thing to think about is uh, even though slugs don't have it, the shell, that's going to be a key characteristic of mollusks, is the fact that they have a shell, that they have these uh, body plans that just really allow for free movement, very, uh, I, I guess you could just say gooey in that sense. That's, that's one way to think about it. Next up are the cephalopods. The term cephalopod literally means, cephala refers to your head, Pod refers to your feet. It literally means that the feet extend from the head. And so this is a common characteristic of this group. And again, some of them we do see have shells like this nautilus here. Or um, if you've ever seen a fossil of what's called an ammonite, you've seen the ammonite shells. And scientists believe that this is what an ammonite kind of looked like. It was more, uh, had more cephalopod features than gastropod features. And so this includes not just the nautilus, but your cuttlefish, your octopi, and your squids, uh, including Squidward up here. So another thing that you'll notice is that, except for the nautilus, you really don't see a shell on any of these organisms. And that's because they really don't have one. The few exceptions might be where it's not so much a shell, but some type of calcium deposit that's made makes up part of the organism whether it be a shell or it be a beak like we see with squids that's uh how they eat is they have a beak or with cuttlefish it's an internal shell this does not mean that they are uh a vertebrate and have actual bones but nonetheless their shells on the inside and if you've ever had a pet bird or a pet turtle or you've just been to the pet store and you see in those animal sections where they have cuddle bones, it's not called a cuddle bone because the animal might cuddle up next to it. It's called a cuddle bone because it literally comes from the cuttlefish. Those cuddle bones 
are basically the cuttlefish's calcium deposit on the inside that help give it some structure. Another characteristic about cephalopods is that these tentacles uh, sometimes will have suction cups on them, sometimes not. That helps them to grasp onto their prey. But one thing that they often do have in common are these uh, pigmented cells. And what these pigmented cells do is they actually allow them to change their color. A lot of people think that chameleons are the ones that can blend in great with their surroundings. And yes, they do have some chromatophores, which are the cells that help them change colors. Uh, but their chromatophores only help them to a certain extent. Whereas, uh, like, you can kind of see Squidward's uh, leotard here is changing colors. In reality, a squid can actually do that, just that. They can change their colors that rapidly. And they use it for different reasons, and it's really amazing. And I'll probably have a video for you guys next week uh, that shows this in action. But sometimes they'll use it to hide from their predator or from prey or uh, predators. Other times, they'll use it as a hunting technique where they'll use it as a distraction. And it's actually been recorded where some squids will hunt in groups where one squid will distract the prey by changing all these different colors while the other squid comes in from the side and attacks. Uh, very similar to the raptors in Jurassic Park, and uh, but something that really does happen. So that's our cephalopods. And then last but not least, the last mollusk that we're going to talk about are the mussels, the clams, the oysters, the scallops. These are what we call the bivalves. Bivalvia refers to bi meaning two, valve referring to the shell. It's this uh, two-layered shell that they have that keeps the entire organism on the inside. Uh, they do have internal organs just like all the other animals that we've talked about today. and. Uh, these organs help them with doing all the things that they need to, like eating, excreting waste, reproduction, but they're all found within the comfort of these little shells. And so when you look at the shell, that's not really the organism, that's just its kind of protective home. The actual organism is what lives on the inside. Now here you can also see it says that they have a foot, just like your uh, snails and slugs and octopi. These do have a uh, pseudo foot, you could say, in the sense that they have this protrusion that will come out that helps them to move. Other ways that they move are surprisingly just like they show in SpongeBob, where they can kind of just be sitting there and all of a sudden they're going to use that shell to help them move around. And so it's kind of weird the first time that you see it. Another thing I want you to notice are all those little tentacles. On the outside. This is a bivalve, all right, because he has one, two shells. But look at all these little things. I want you to think for a second what do you think they're for? And if you thought that they might have been used for helping them get food, you are absolutely right because these guys are what we consider filter feeders, which means that they'll just kind of sit there and uh, sometimes they'll bury themselves in the dirt or attach themselves to some object and so they won't move around, they'll just stay there and they'll let all the food come to them. They can be found in freshwater environments and in marine environments. That's why sometimes you might be walking somewhere, uh, not at the beach, but maybe if you've ever been to Circle B or out by a lake, and you see what look like a bunch of little clamshells. Those are from freshwater bivalves that a lot of the animals have pulled out, whether it be a raccoon or a bird, to actually eat what's inside. And so again, most of the time they're going to be in the sand or attached to something, but they do have the ability to move if they need to. All right, last but not least, the echinoderms. Uh, echinodermata is a very broad phylum, and in fact, there are thousands of more extinct species than species that are alive today. And what I mean by that is that there are some types of echinoderms that we find heavily in the fossil record. We find lots and lots of them. And in fact, we find lots and lots of different species of echinoderms. There was a point 
in our history where these echinoderms just thrived on Earth. Some of them were sea dollars, some of them were sea urchins, uh, but others were these other types of uh, echinoderms that we really don't see much of anymore, uh, but were nonetheless there. And so it's kind of weird to think, but yes, uh, like Patrick Starr here and the sea urchins, they belong to the same group of organisms, these echinoderms. And so what generally is going to define these organisms are several things. First of all, they have radial symmetry, all right, which means if you remember back, we were talking about jellyfish and stuff, you could divide them into basically like four equal parts uh, from the middle. And so that would be our radial symmetry. They don't have very good bilateral symmetry or, I mean, uh, they they do have that some sort of symmetry, but you can cut them in half, but then you can cut them in another half, and so on and so forth. Uh, speaking of cutting in half, a misconception about these guys is sometimes you can cut off the legs of a sea star, and when you cut off all the legs of a sea star, uh, people say that every single one of those legs that you cut off will turn into a new sea star. And in fact, somebody asked me this question last week when we were talking about flatworms and how they can reproduce that way. Sadly, starfish cannot. There are a few species of starfish where if you were to take the central disc, which is kind of like the main body portion of the sea star, if you were to take that central disc and cut that in half, then there is the possibility that you could end up with two sea stars. But again, that's only a few species that can do that. If you were to take all these sea stars and just chop off all their legs, all you would do is just chop off all their legs. They could grow those legs back, but they're not going to grow into five different sea stars. And so, again, they had that radial symmetry. Their endoskeleton is made out of these plates known as ossicles. And if you've ever looked at a sea star, that's all these little uh, bumpy, spiny things. It's those ossicles. And so if you've ever looked at a sea star like in a gift shop or something, and you notice that they're kind of hard when they dry, that's what's left over is their endoskeleton. It's the same with sea urchins. They have that similar uh, structure. How they move about is very similar to the jellyfish in the sense that they have a water vascular system. In other words, they have all these uh, tubes that are filled with water, almost like a hydraulic system. And depending on whether water is in or out of these certain tubes allows the animal or the organism to move around, which it uses these little tube feet. And uh, you can kind of see right here these little yellow things. Those are the tube feet. Now, again, I challenge you, if you have a dried up sea star at home or next time that you go to a like a beach resort gift shop, look at this, the, the starfish there and flip them over. And when you flip them over, you should be able to see the remnants of their tube feet there. And uh, so that's some basic anatomy about it. Also, if you notice our starfish here, he's actually lying face down. The mouth of the starfish is actually on the underside. And again, it has the two openings like our worms do because it needs some place to let all that stuff go out. And so if you uh, read in the textbook, you could have even seen where it showed a starfish attacking a bivalve and sucking the organism out. What it does is basically... So this purple thing here is its stomach. It pushes that stomach out, absorbs everything that's in there, and then it feeds through and everything comes out the other end. All right, and so that's going to wrap it up for today. Uh, just to kind of recap what we talked about, we talked about three different phylums. We talked about the annelids, which are your segmented worms like earthworms. We discussed their digestive system and how they have a closed circulatory system. Then we talked about the mollusks and how they're divided into three large groups. Your gastropods, which include your snails and slugs. Your cephalopods, which include your octopi, your squids, cuttlefish, and nautiluses. And your bivalves, uh, you, the third group, the bivalves, which includes pretty much your clams, shells, uh, like clams, oysters, things like that. And then our last phylum we talked about were the echinoderms, which include your starfish your sea urchins, and your sand dollars. So again, tomorrow is just a makeup day for any work that you might be missing. We also have our YouTube live tomorrow if you have any questions about this or any of your work. So 
Until then, I'll talk to y'all later. Thank you.